Lenape 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 Rivière des Chawanons 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 Shawnee River So, the very last major land battle of the American Revolutionary War happened on October 19th, 1781. The Battle of Yorktown, or the Siege of Yorktown, at least. That's what the children's American history books taught them. The Battle of Yorktown, last battle, October 19th, 1781. That's forgetting about the Battle of Blue Licks in 1782 with Daniel Boone in Kentucky, which was after Yorktown. Yorktown happened October 19th, 1781. Hugh McGarry's defeat at the Battle of the Blue Licks happened August 19th, 1782. That's nearly a year afterwards. We're also forgetting like a whole bunch of battles. The French victory, the Battle of Sadras, the capital of Montserrat, Battle of Wambal, Wambal. It's a British victory, February 1782. Here's a Spanish Patriot victory, the Battle of Roatan. British Iroquois victory, the Battle of Little Mountain. Franco Patriot victory, Hudson Bay Expedition, Siege of Bryan Station, Patriot victor, victory, August 15 to 17, 1782. And it says Virginia, but that's Bryan Station. Kentucky had a Bryan Station too. And the Battle of Blue Luke. So the Virginia, I guess they're saying the Virginia Militia. Because Kentucky was a county of Virginia. But it was fighting Native Americans. The Battle of Blue Licks. That would be your Daniel Boone. Isaiah Boone. Hugh McGarry. It's 1782. So why did they tell us that the Battle of Yorktown, the Siege of Yorktown, is the last battle if we've had at least two, three dozen more battles afterwards? Eventually the Treaty of Paris in... 1783 ends all hostilities. The biggest defeat that I want to talk about right now is William Crawford's defeat of 1782 near the Sandusky River in northeastern Ohio, which was after October 19th, 1781. The Siege of Yorktown, the defeat of Cornwallis. So now we're going to go to Ohio, which is Miami, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Lenape, Native American, deep in the Native American territory. William Crawford's defeat, 1782, happened after the American Revolution because the American Revolution just wasn't about overthrowing British tyranny, but it was about taking the land away from Native Americans, which is why William Crawford was pulled out of retirement by Irvin, Mr. Irvin, Irvine. I said, let's go on a turkey shoot. Let's go on another one last expedition, one last midnight run. William Crawford started out with 500 Pennsylvania Minutemen soldiers on May 25th, 1782. And he set out to murder a bunch of Native Americans on the Sandusky River, deep in Indian territory in the Ohio country. One month Two weeks later, after this expedition by William Crawford and 500 Minutemen from Pennsylvania began, one month, two weeks later, by July 11th, 1782, William Crawford had been captured by the Lenape, by Captain Pipe, in Wingenund, or Wing, Wingenund, Wingenund, I like Wingenund better, personally it sounds better to me, but it could be Wingenund, Genund. Wingenund, wing, enun, wingenun, or wingenun. Is it wing or win? Right. Okay. So I'll go with wing. I like wing. So until someone corrects me, wingenun. <laughs> so wingenun, Captain Pipe. They're out there. They're fighting, and they captured William Crawford.
The Delawares had secured the big captain of the invading army, a prize they were determined should not be lost, as evidenced by William Crawford being guarded from the Sandusky River to the T. Mochti, the T. Mochti River by their two war chiefs, Captain Pipe and Wingenun. Common prisoners were tomahawked with little ado, but William Crawford was reserved for a much more inspiring and cathartic and terrible death. William Crawford and John Knight were taken to Wingenun's camp on June 7th, where they found nine other prisoners. On June 11th, Hobocam, a.k.a. Captain Pipe, painted the faces of the prisoners black, the traditional sign that they were to be executed. The prisoners were marched to the Lenape, Delaware town on the Tai Muchti, the Tai Mokti Creek, near the present-day village of Crawford, Ohio. <laughs> Crawford. So, um, seriously, I'm not making that up. They actually named the town after this fucking loser. This is where he dies. Let's name a town after him. But Frankfurt was actually named after a Jewish settler who got killed, supposedly, by Native Americans. Frank's Ford, old Frank, Mr. Frank, the Jewish founder of Frankfurt. The name, the namesake of Frankfurt. I think I'm going to say Stephen Frank. So, in the present day village of Crawford, Ohio, they had this motherfucker burnt. Four of Crawford's imprisoned men, the other prisoners, were killed with tomahawks, scalped along the way. When the war party stopped, the seven remaining prisoners were made to sit with William Crawford and John Knight a short distance from the others. Lenape and Delaware women and boys killed the other five with tomahawks, beheading one of them. The boys scalped the victims and slapped the bloody scalps in the faces of William Crawford and his little friend, John Knight. There is a fire burning at the spot where on the afternoon of June the 11th, we left the Delawares, the Lenapes, Exonym versus Autonym, in charge of William Crawford and followed the fortunes of Knight. Around that fire was a crowd of Indians, about 30 or 40 men, and 60 or 70 squaws and boys. A few Wyandots were there. Simon Gertie was with them all. Dunquat, a chief of the Wyandot people, half king of the Wyandot people. A few Wyandots. Simon Gertie, as previously mentioned. Perhaps Matthew Elliott. John Knight wrote later that he remembered one British agent that was there, but that sounds like utter nonsense, just complete propaganda. Dunquat, aka Pomo a can, Pomo a can, so Pomo a can, also known as the half king of the Wyandot people in the Ohio country fighting Americans in the West. Dunquat, he led a mixed band of about 200 Indians, predominantly Wyandot and Mingo, but there are also some Shawnee in Delaware. At the siege of Fort Henry in 1777, during the war, he protected Christian Delaware people from other members of their tribe, prejudiced against their beliefs. Half King was particularly attentive to prevent all drunkenness, knowing that bloodshed and murder would immediately follow. Dunquad insisted on the removal of the Christian Indians from the vicinity of Sandusky, Believing it to be unsafe for them to remain there, Dunquat also protected the Moravians and their converts from maltreatments when the missionaries were sent to Detroit. There, too, at the immobilization spot where William Crawford is going to be burnt to a crisp, like, like a piece of overly burnt toast or a bundle of sticks in the middle of a fire, Charcoal, Kingsford, Charcoal, Kingsford, which is Kentucky made, Kentucky product home through and through. So if you support Kentucky, buy Kingsford, Charcoals. Nah, I'm not a spokesperson, I'm just telling you to do it. 
There was Samuel Wells, the Negro boy, evidently a slave, African American who had been captured by the Native Americans, Indians, as previously stated, and who afterward stoutly affirmed to early white settlers in the Sandusky country that his employment at the time was the holding of Simon Gertie's horse. A spectator, likewise, but an unwilling and horrified one, as was John Knight, Dr. John Knight, who stood a short distance from the fire, securely bound and guarded by the rough visaged Tutelu. 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 So Tutelu is like, hey, John Wright, you shut your mouth. John Wright's going to escape, and he's the one that writes about this whole thing. But William Crawford does not escape. He starts praying. Lord God Almighty, whispered the mortified prisoner, have mercy on my soul. Dear God, help me to conquer my fear and bear with strength what is going to be done to me here and now. With this impassioned prayer and a grim countenance, William Crawford stared into the eyes of his tormentors. Three quarters of a mile away from Captain Pipe's house, Hobocam, Hopocan, Hopocan, Captain Pipe, Hopocan's house, three quarters of a mile away from his house, three quarters of a mile away from Captain Pipe's house, also known as Hopocan, Hopocan's house, the Lenape, Delaware village upon the Timuchti River, here, the spot where William Crawford was now to be immolated to satisfy the revengeful thirst of the Lenape, Delaware, for the blood of the borderers, what was in present-day Crawford Township, no joke, Crawford Township, in Wyandotte County, I shit you not, and it was a short distance northeast from the current present-day town of Crawfordsville, so, laughing my fat ass off, right? Mike drop my imaginary Mike drop peace my nigga Obama Obama you my nigga less than a mile away from Hobocan's house Captain Pipes house at about four o'clock in the afternoon of Tuesday June 11th 1782 the torture of William Crawford began so William Crawdad Crawford was stripped naked as a jaybird in order to sit down, sit down, William Crawford, you naked jaybird, you. It's a tradition seemingly well authenticated that his clothes, especially his hat, which was made of leather, were long after in the keeping of the Lenape people. The Lenape now beat William Crawford with sticks and with their fist, and they were doing the same thing to John Knight. The fatal stake, a post about 15 foot high, had been firmly set into the ground. That was where William Crawford was going to roast. Beef, like a pig. William Crawford's hands were bound behind his back and a rope fastened on one end to the foot of the post and the other to the ligature between his wrist. The rope was long enough for him to sit down or walk around the post once or twice and return the same way. William Crawford cried out to Simon Gertie, who was an interpreter, a white Indian, very similar to John Tanner, a white Indian. He's gone Indian, right? William Crawford calls out to Simon Gertie and asks if the Native Americans were going to burn him. Simon Gertie just plainly said yes. William Crawford replied that he would accept the torture patiently like a real man. A real gentleman. About 100 men, women, and children had gathered at the Delaware Lenape village to witness the execution of the big white captain. Dunquat, a Wyandot chief, a few Wyandots, as well as Simon Gertie and perhaps Matthew Elliott. Upon this, Captain Pipe made a speech to the Indians, the Lenape, and the Wyandots, Simon Gertie. He's given a speech to the Native Americans, who at its conclusion, he yelled a hideous and hearty assent to what had been said. Captain Pipe, a.k.a. Hopacan, which literally means tobacco pipe, a.k.a. 
Cone E S Quano Heel. Cone E S Quano Heel. That's his maiden name at birth and during his childhood. Who knew William Crawford from the 1778 Fort Pitt Treaty spoke to the crowd, pointing out that William Crawford had been captured while leading many of the men who had committed the Naden Hutton murders. The Naden Hutton murders. With a G. N A D. Naden Hutton. William Crawford had nothing to do with the massacre, but William Crawford had taken part in the Squaw Campaign, which killed several of Captain Pipe's family members, like his mother, brother, not everybody. There was like three like major family members that was killed, some of his kids. Captain Pipe mentioned the massacre upon his family. He mentioned the Naden Hutton murders. He's getting him riled up, and he's saying, this is why we are going to burn William Crawford. Captain Pipe was an 18th century chief of the Algonquin-speaking Lenape, Delaware, a member of the Wolf Clan. Captain Pipe was a Lenape warrior and by 1773 succeeded his maternal uncle, Custaloga, as chief, part of a group that had moved from Pennsylvania to Ohio around the time of the French and Indian War. After Captain Chief Hobacam, tobacco pipe, maybe marijuana pipe, maybe marijuana bowl, Chief Hobokan, Captain, because that's what the English had called him since he was the chief. Tobacco Pipe speech, a large fire. After his speech, a large fire was lit about six or seven yards, six meters from the pole. William Crawford could offer little resistance as he was mercilessly pummeled by closed fist and beaten with heavy sticks. The Lenape and other various Native American men shot several charges of gunpowder into William Crawford's body. Then they cut off both of his ears, severed from his bruised head, and then they held his ears high aloft as the assembled spectators cheered wildly as blood ran down the side of William Crawford's head. An old squaw whose appearance thought John Knight Every way answered the ideas people entertain of the devil, got aboard, took a parcel of coals and ashes and laid them on his back and head. The old squaw got another board full of burning coals and hot embers and then threw them on him. William Crawford then raised himself upon his feet and began to walk around the post, but in a short time he had nothing but hot coals of fire and hot ashes he was compelled to walk on. The burning sticks were near William Crawford, but he seemed to have become more and more insensible to the pain than before. The Amara Indian men took up their guns and shot powder again into Crawford's <laughs> naked body repeatedly, shooting at point-blank range <laughs> by muskets whose barrels were filled with gunpowder from his feet as far up his neck. So they're shooting up his entire body, except for his head. John Knight wrote that not less than 70 loads were discharged upon William Crawford. This gruesome process reenacted more than 70 times, searing his body from head to toe and blackening his face into a gruesome mask of blood and soot. At least from his neck to his toe. At last, under the strain of unrelenting misery, his resolve crumbled. Finally, William Crawford began to scream as the red hot tips of flaming twigs, which had been roasting in the roaring bonfire behind him, were pressed into his already charred flesh, leaving smoldering contusions on his chest, face, genitals, and buttocks. William Crawford begged Gertie to shoot him, but Simon Gertie was either unwilling or afraid to intervene. Overcome by agony, William Crawford cried out, Gertie, Gertie, for God's sakes! Simon Gertie, shoot me through the heart! The raucous den grew ominously silent as all eyes came to rest on the man they called Gertie, that William Crawford called Gertie, Simon Gertie, but the white savage made no answer. William Crawford called again. 
After a moment of introspection, Simon Gurney arose from a seated position by the fire and strode to where William Crawford lay sobbing. I cannot, Simon Gurdy replied softly. As you can see, I have no gun. Turning away from William Crawford's mangled figure, Simon Gurdy turned about to a Native American who was behind him, laughed heartily, <laughs> delighted at the horrid scene. So Simon Gurdy was laughing heartily. I don't have a gun. So William Crawford, hey! What 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 do you want me to do, guy? I ain't got no gun. How can I shoot you in the heart? Ah, get out of here. Encouraged by this show of remorseless sarcasm, William Crawford's tormentors renewed their assault and the cheers of the onlookers reached a fever pitch as the colonel finally lost consciousness under the continuous rain of blows. After about two hours of torture, William Crawford fell down unconscious. As a final insult, William Crawford's sandy brown hair was savagely hacked from his skull and paraded through the frenzied throng, even as his mutilated carcass was unceremoniously hurled into the rage and fire. After William Crawford was scalped, a woman poured hot coals over his head, which had revived him. He began to walk about insensibly as the torture continued. Then he laid down on his stomach. Once he went unconscious, they took his body and just chucked it into the bonfire that was lit next to him. It was a tradition long after repeated by the Lenape and Wyandotte people that William Crawford breathed his last breath at the moment that the sun went down. After he finally died, his body was burnt up completely. The Lenape then scalped him through the scalp into the face of John Knight telling him, look at your great chief now. John Knight was then taken away from the dreadful scene. Rivière des Shawanons. 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 Shawnee River. This happened December 7th, today, on Friday, today is Sunday, so this is two days. This is what I look like two days afterwards. Um, I wasn't as swollen, I didn't have all the black eyes as I did before. Uh, it was uh, My nose was crooked and it's bleeding all over the place, uh, but it wasn't like this puffy. It wasn't, didn't have the black eyes like this and, um, you know, it wasn't. Uh, I think it kind of looks, looks worse now. They didn't want to reset it there because they said if we're going to reconstruct a surgery just might as well go ahead and do it all you know in one shot when it's swollen uh sometimes you reset the nose and it doesn't go in the right place it's hard to tell because you know it's swollen so they want to wait for the swelling to go down um yeah i mean that's 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 the most of it All right, so I live here in South Louisville on Iowa Street. So this is my neighborhood right here. It's a bike shop. It's my house. Here's down the street. There's Cardinal Stadium there. There's the uh, new name Catholic Church. So I'm talking about the uh, incidents that had uh, happened with it made my face the way it looks like today. 
So I'm talking about these incidents. The more I talk about, the more uh, I'll be able to speak confidently about what it exactly happened. And I won't back down. I won't get nervous by some aggressive politicians since politicians only care about uh, winning. It's about competition. It's not actually about finding the truth out. So it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a competition, right? So, okay, 319 Iowa Avenue. This is where I live. So um, uh, on the 7th, December 7th, I said I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to go to the store and pick up a couple of things. There's a store right down here uh, about two blocks away. Uh, there's a Dollar General. There's a car wash. There's a convenience store. And then there's a gas station. So, okay, so I come out here. It's only one block away. So I'm just walking down this street here, walking down this sidewalk, exactly as I'm doing right now. So it's only two blocks away. I'm on a uh, Iowa Avenue and 4th Avenue. I'm coming up to M Street and 4th Avenue. And M Street and 4th Avenue is where it happened. And uh, the cops on the scene actually did say that there was like some cameras um, up, up on these poles somewhere. I don't know if it's true, it was six, around 6 p.m. on uh, December 7th, on Friday. So, walking down this road here, just walking down the sidewalk, when I get up here to this mailbox, I'm gonna make a left, I'm gonna cross, because it's kinda like right now. See, there's nobody crossing here, nobody crossing here. There's not a crosswalk the entire time here, so I'd have to walk all the way up here for the crosswalk. And I could have easily just crossed right across right there. So before, after I cross this mailbox, I see that uh, there's nobody on the left-hand side, there's nobody on the right-hand side, but there's a car on the opposite side, it was a white car. Okay, so the white car, well, 